In Africa's Great Rift Valley, a ragged chain of magnificent volcanoes dominates the surrounding savannas. Some are dead. Others steam as they sleep. And at least one is very much alive. The most famous of all, the tallest volcano in the world and an icon of Africa is the great white mountain, Kilimanjaro. Snow and ice so near the equator fires the imagination. But Kili's pure white summit may soon be a thing of the past. The glaciers at the top are steadily shrinking. If the life-giving water runs out, will the mountain and all that lives in its shadow die too? Kilimanjaro stands in Tanzania, East Africa, just south of the Kenyan border. Kilimanjaro is a colossus, the largest freestanding mountain in the world. It cannot easily be brought to its knees. Three degrees south of the equator, Kili rises to a height of nearly six kilometers. Its footprint covers over 1,600 kilometers, twice the size of London. The immense weight of this massive mountain has depressed the surrounding plains by nearly 200 meters. Its famous snows disguise its own violent volcanic origins. It last exploded 400 years ago. Since then, it's been sleeping, but could awake at any time. Kili may be slumbering, but not far away, Aldonio Lengai, the Maasai's sacred mountain of God, still breathes fire. At 2,700 meters, Aldonio Lengai is a mountain in the making and the only active volcano in the Great Rift. Down in the depths of its crater, molten lava can bubble up from open vents at any time. The hot black magma turns an ashen gray white as it cools and solidifies. Lengai last erupted violently nearly 40 years ago, and it smothered everything with a suffocating cloak of ash. But life soon returned, even to the very top. The clip springer's truncated hooves are adapted for rock climbing, and its insulated coat enables it to withstand freezing nights at high altitude. Mount Meru erupted 80 kilometers to the west of Kili. Although it appears a young volcano with a near-perfect cone, Meru was once taller than its neighbor. Today, at just over four and a half thousand meters, it's a mere relic of its former self. Volcanoes, for all their present tranquility, are born of tumultuous times.
Kili lies on an intersection of major fault lines in the Rift Valley. It's built up of three volcanoes, not one. Shiro was once over 5,000 meters high. Now its weathered and collapsed cone is under 4,000 meters. Moenzi erupted 18 kilometers from Shiro. Half a million years ago, Kibo, the highest at just under 5,800 meters, grew in the middle on the shoulders of the others. Of all the animals living in the shadow of Kilimanjaro, none is more associated than elephants. For generations, they roam the length and breadth of the Great White Mountain. Now people have claimed Kili for themselves, and these gentle giants are only found on the northern and western slopes. Today, their main stronghold is Amboseli National Park, just over the Kenyan border below the northern foothills. Elephants survive here because the park is protected and the mountain is a great provider. Kilimanjaro is so big it creates its own weather system. When winds from the sea rise to the top of the mountain, clouds form. They deposit moisture, usually a snow on the peaks and this filters down through the porous lava rock and a labyrinth of underground aquifers until it surfaces in swamps and springs in the heart of Amboseli. Where there is water, there's life. And when it rains at the mountain's feet, there is new life. Not a lot makes a mature elephant run. Eager to quench their thirst and excited by the smell of water, the herds charge down to the swamps. is central to the lives of the Amboseli elephants. Given a choice, they like to drink every day and can swallow 11 liters of water at a time. Water is also a coolant. And muddy water acts as a natural sunscreen and insect repellent. Splashing about in mud also looks a lot of fun.
Egrets feed at the feet of the giants. They eat insects and perhaps reduce the number plaguing the elephants. Maybe this is why they're allowed to hitch a ride. It's almost as if each bird has its own steed. A ton of elephants wading in the shallows disturbs a lot of mud and all the creatures that lurk in it. Spoonbills that have migrated from Europe make the most of the opportunity. Elephants cross to islands in Amboseli swamps. They're good swimmers. Millions of years ago, their ancestors were aquatic. They've even been seen swimming an incredible 24 kilometers off the coast of Kenya. An elephant's trunk is its most versatile tool. Swamp grasses are not firmly rooted. The elephants bite off the green shoots, leaving roots and mud behind. Crowned cranes coincide their breeding season with the coming of the rains. Their elaborate performance is designed to impress a mate. following the rain trail of the mighty herds. Wildebeest wander the plains below the mountain forever in search of new grass. And where there is prey, there are predators. Although success is not a given. Elephants can give birth all year round, but most are born after the rains. This tiny baby is newborn. It's still unsteady on its feet. Its mother is anxious to join the rest of her family. And here's the reason why. A lion could kill an elephant calf but the risks of being injured by such a powerful mother are too great.
In years of plentiful rainfall, great gatherings of over 600 elephants congregate in Amboseli's swamps, forming one huge and spectacular herd. For the adults, it's a time to meet up with old acquaintances and new babies. For the youngsters, it's an important time to learn by watching the adults and socializing with others of their own age. It's like one big elephant festival. This is a male in must, an Indian word meaning intoxicated. Flooded with testosterone, a must male's prime objective is to find a mate. So many females congregating around the swamps, there's no better time to be must. Each male will test every female he meets. If she's not receptive to his advances, he'll walk on to the next one. His wanderings will take him far and wide and well beyond the park boundaries. Elephants cannot survive on marsh grasses and reeds alone. They leave the protection of the park to browse on trees. And when they do so, they're in danger. And it's not just men with guns that are a threat. This female returned to Amboseli's swamps with a seriously swollen leg. Researchers think she may have trodden on poisoned nails or spikes. She's been limping for months, but fortunately she's slowly getting better. Another female was not so lucky. The infection in her foot led to septicemia, 
and she died of blood poisoning. Elephants behave in mysterious ways around their dead. As soon as they catch the scent of a skeleton of one of their own, they go very quiet. why they stroke or pick up the bones. They don't behave in the same way to the remains of any other wild animal. We'll never know what's going on in their heads, but they do seem to have some concept of death and recognize what was another of their kind. Snares are cheap, deadly, and indiscriminate killers. They're set to catch small animals for the illegal bush meat trade, but they trap anything that steps in them. In its struggle to get free, this young elephant has pulled the wire so tight, it's cut through its leg right down to the bone. Unless the snare is taken off, this baby will die. Kenya's Wildlife Service has a policy of only treating animals suffering at the hands of man. To help in this case, they must isolate the stricken calf and drive off its family. The little killie elephant has been darted and the snare is being removed. Antibiotic injections will prevent infection while the wound heals. Elephants are fiercely protective of their young. The matriarch of the family and the baby's mother refuse to leave and could be dangerous. An armed marksman stands guard just in case. Within minutes, the operation is complete and the vet is ready to inject an antidote to the anaesthetic. Although very frightened, the family stay as close as they dare. This is one very lucky elephant. The vets reported that its chances for a full recovery were high. To late afternoon, the herds begin a march that will take them well beyond the park boundary. Many families move up the mountain where the higher ground and richer earth produce more nutritious and tastier plants. As they head towards the foothills, they move into Maasai thornbush country. Cattle are a Maasai's prized possession. As long as no elephant kills a cow, the Maasai accept the wild herds grazing alongside their domestic animals.
This warrior tribe has a fearsome reputation, but they don't kill game for meat. Neither will they tolerate outsiders hunting in their land. For hundreds of years, they've been unintentional protectors of Kilimanjaro's wilderness and wildlife. However, when Rinderpest killed thousands of Maasai cattle, the tribe was weakened, and this allowed an invasion of strangers, including hunters and poachers. Ultimately, this led to the international demand for ivory and the elephant's demise. Although the Maasai do not hunt wildlife for food, a few elephants are speared every year by warriors proving their might and bravery. These attacks are enough to keep the elephants wary. Elephants have been trudging up Kilimanjaro for thousands of years. They move through the dry thornbush country and up to the cooler meadows found at around 2,000 meters. This fertile belt is now intensely farmed and almost all of the elephants' traditional migration routes have gone under the plow. Here, even the Maasai are using their precious cattle to cultivate the fields. As farmers rather than herdsmen, they'll not be so willing to share their land with wildlife. Increasingly, there are complaints about destroyed crops and a need for more land. There is one narrow corridor left through which the elephants can move up to the forest, but without good incentives to keep a safe passage open, how long before people look to the corridor to feed an ever-growing number of human mouths? Crops are now planted right next to the forest. Lush fields full of maize, wheat and barley are hard for wild animals to resist. Blue or Sykes monkeys cannot resist such sumptuous fare. When people grow crops right next to the tree line, they're inviting trouble. Big grain farmers expect to lose a percentage of their crop. Unfortunately, a single man with a slingshot has little effect. Monkeys are intelligent. They'll simply hide in the trees until he's passed. True denizens of the forest, black and white colobus monkeys were once a marksman's target. Only 50 years ago, capes made of their silky black and white coats were coveted by the rich and famous. Now they are protected and safe to let their unearthly roars ring out across the trees. The canopy is the monkey's highway in the forest. Many of the trees on Kili's gentler slopes have been felled to make way for agriculture. But between two and three thousand meters up the mountain, there's still some rainforest left. And amazingly, there are elephants right up here. Kilimanjaro's elusive forest elephants. Shy and retiring, they try to stay hidden.
They're not a different species from the Amboseli families, and the two types occasionally meet when their paths cross. Twenty-five years ago, there were a thousand forest elephants on the mountain. Now, there are only 220. Poaching for ivory reached fever pitch in the 1980s and hit the killie elephants badly. Salt is one thing that will entice even the most retiring animal out into the open. Minerals are in short supply on the mountain. They get washed away. But there are exposed places in the forest where mineral-rich veins in the soil have been uncovered by erosion. The forest elephants have the tools to mine for salt. Above the forest in a panorama that conjures up images of goblins and elves, tussock grasses and tree heathers dominate the landscape. Seeing elephants up here at 3,000 meters seems somehow unearthly. Yet surprisingly for such big animals, they can achieve great heights. Above the moors, the landscape is stark, vegetation sparse. This is an unforgiving alien world. Here at 4,000 meters, Kili's high plateau can't sustain most large animals. Only the tough and remarkably adaptable eland can eke out a living. One reason why there are so few large wild animals on the mountain is because there are so many of one animal in particular. Conquering this mountain is the dream of many visitors to Tanzania, and about 20,000 hikers climb it every year. Rubbish was a big problem, but now most of the tour organizers abide by the motto, leave only footprints. But even with the best intentions, there's always something left behind, and if it's edible, it doesn't last very long. Sudden changes in cloud cover and wind force can cause a drop of 20 degrees in as little as 30 minutes. At 4,000 meters, weird-looking giant ground soles and lobelias are two of the few plants that can cope with such fluctuating conditions.
after a night spent tightly closed, lobelias open like a new flower to greet the rising sun. Prehistoric-looking 20-foot-high giant groundsels never shed their old leaves. Instead, they fold down around the trunk to form a shaggy, insulating lagging, which prevents ice forming inside the stem. The incredibly giant lobelias are related to the popular plants that people grow in hanging baskets in their gardens. The tall flowers of giant lobelias grow to one and a half meters in just a few weeks. Living in a land of fierce winds, these plants rely on birds to pollinate them. The sunbird's long bill and tongue gives it a great advantage in reaching the nectar at the base of each flower. As they sip the nectar, even the chicks do their part in pollinating the flowers. This iridescent little bird has an intimate relationship with this astonishing plant and is the only sunbird that can live at such great height. Many insects attack giant groundsels and lobelias. Little grubs and flies infest their leaf rosettes. It's thought that the sunbirds come as much for them as for the nectar. So great is its height that nowhere in all of Africa is harsher than Kilimanjaro's upper slopes. It came as a great surprise to the famous explorer Wilfred Thesiger to encounter wild dogs at 5,800 meters. One of his men photographed a dog that had followed his party almost to the summit. Porters tell stories of young boys who, new to their job, lag behind in the high plateau and fall prey to wild dogs. And it's possible these aren't just fanciful tales. There was a report in 1979 of a lone porter being chased by a small pack. It's said tourists rescued him, but not before he lost his little finger to snapping canine jaws. Agile dogs are one thing, but a lumbering elephant up near the top would seem impossible. Yet a sun-bleached elephant skeleton was found years ago at four and a half thousand meters. Recently, this one was discovered one and a half thousand meters higher Perhaps poachers with guns on Kilimanjaro forced a desperate elephant to trudge onwards and upwards until it could climb no more. Only the large bones are left on the mountain. The bone breakers remove all the smaller ones. Lamagayas, or bearded vultures, Africa's largest birds of prey eat bones. Food is so sparse on these upper slopes that the mountain can only support a few pairs. They scour the land below for food, soaring and gliding great distances. This is one large animal that can get to the very top. The crater at Kilimanjaro's summit stretches over half a kilometer across. Locked in by snow and ice, it's hard to believe that it once boiled over with molten lava. For now, the giant slumbers, but the soil in the crater is hot enough to warm frozen feet. A 
As it sleeps, Killy exhales hot breath. Fumaroles, or vents, release hot gases, showing that this mountain is far from dead. Sulfur and carbonate residues from active vents fetch a good price in the villages below. This rare and hard to come by crater salt is used to induce a miscarriage and in minute quantities it's said to cure a colicky baby. Local tribes speak of aged elephants ascending Kili to die by hurling themselves into its crater, denying poachers of their precious prize. Any man who dares can climb down into the ash pit at the center of the crater. But if he's greedy and takes the biggest tusks, he'll be struck blind and fated to meet a wretched end. No elephant graveyard has ever been found, but there is evidence of a broader deterioration. Nothing is immune to the forces that shape our planet. Even the two and a half square kilometers of glaciers right at the mountain's peak. In these frozen, oxygen-starved heights, it's hard to believe that the equator is just three degrees to the north, and the scorching plains are just a few kilometers down below. Fortunately, the glaciers are only the icing on the top. The water that melts from them simply evaporates into the thin air. But what gives the mountain life is water from another source. It's the forests that are essential. This lush belt of trees absorbs rainfall and moisture from the clouds. The mosses and lichens that cover everything in the forest act like a living sponge. This is where most of the water comes from. Destroy the forests and Kilimanjaro will be laid bare. Then its slopes and surrounding plains will wither and everything living in its shadow, including its most valuable and vulnerable animal, will suffer. Kili's rare forest elephants have survived, just. Tear down the trees and they will have nowhere to hide. But the elephants don't have to disappear with the glaciers. Kilimanjaro may lose its tiara of ice, but it will still snow at the summit. The mountain won't lose its symbolic white crown. As long as the forests remain intact, the great white mountain will continue to give life to all that lives in its shadow.